Hello artists, friends, and supporters. Welcome to our very first Creative Capital Carnival. I'm Christine Kwan, President and Executive Director, and I could not be more excited to kick off this landmark celebration of and for artists today. You are witnessing the earliest stages of new projects for our 2022 Creative Capital grantees. What you are about to experience is advanced access to the art of the future. Since our founding in 1999, Creative Capital Foundation has been dedicated to funding artists at catalytic moments in their careers. We are honored to count amongst our alumni visionaries such as visual artist Simone Lee, choreographer Ralph Lemon, filmmaker Christina Ibarra, jazz composer Vijay Iyer, writer Maggie Nelson, technologist Corey Archangel, Sculptor of Trees, Sam Van Aken, and over 800 more incredible artists. I also want to express our deep gratitude to our founding president, Ruby Lerner, and the Warhol Foundation, who had the foresight to launch our transformative grant-making model to protect free speech and the role artists play in our democracy. Today, we continue to see how vital and inspiring the work of Creative Capital continues to be. Thank you to our artists, to our board of directors, National Advisory Council, the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, and all of our donors for their steadfast support of our work and of our artists. Enjoy. Hi, my name is Mimi. I'm an artist. I make work about things that are hard to count and collect. I want to talk about a project I've been working on for a couple years. It's called Ground Truths. It starts with my hometown. I grew up in a town called Sugarland. It's located right outside of Houston. And in 2018, my former county school district was trying to break ground on a new school. While they were digging, they unearthed the remains of 95 people. Those remains turned out to be from black folks who had died through the 19th century practice of convict leasing and the discovery of them for anybody who knew it caused just unease through our city. It was like, who knew that Sugarland held this past and what should be done about it? Well, it turns out some people had known and had talked about it for a long time, but they hadn't been listened to. And for this project, I'm interrogating all of the structures and practices that maintain that unknowing of my hometown's history. I'm curious about why the remains of the Sugarland 95 were able to cut through that veil of unknowability when other things were not. And I want to tell a story that positions the Sugarland 95 as what they are, which is a national pattern, not an isolated case specific to Texas. To do this, I'm building a machine learning model that can determine whether other, which other counties in the U.S. contain similar mass graves from convict leasing, like the one in my hometown. That model is meant to be a form of evidence that can open the door to collective reckoning, and it will be mathematically and statistically sound. But it's also an impossible model. It will be impossible to dig for these remains, just like how it's impossible for any technical solution to attend fully to grief, to pain, and accountability. Those impossibilities are the things that do count. And my aim is for this project to lead back towards them and back to the people who held these histories and stories all along. Imagine a liberated world beyond binaries, hierarchies, and capital. Is this possible when our realities emerge from deeply embodied histories of violence and continuing oppression? Yes, and we believe BASE can help get us there. BASE, Belief Entity Identifiers, are trauma-informed somatic AI that connect to our autonomic nervous systems and help us process feelings that are produced by and perpetuate systems of oppression. Bays are trusted and beloved AI companions in the form of fantastical, lifelike robot animals. A furry kitten, a scaly cube, a fanciful beast. 
your bay is co-designed with your gut microbiota to expand beyond our human selves towards emerging into many. Bays perform complex diffractive analysis rooted in quantum physics to empower us to take account of and be accountable for the world's becoming. A bay requires yet to exist technologies and collaborations with computer scientists, bioengineers, neuroscientists, somatic healers, robot engineers, and a willingness to liberate ourselves from our self-imposed failure to imagine possibilities beyond what supremacy systems tell us is possible. In our current realities, where trauma crafts our narratives, our organizations, our policies, and our infrastructures, bays are not only possible, they are necessary. It means that abortions are outlawed at conception, and some abortion clinics have already said they would stop their practice if this passed. House Bill 4327 is now law, and it takes effect immediately. We got word the governor signed it earlier this evening. The law not only prohibits abortion starting at fertilization, it also allows people to sue anyone who aids or abets a woman seeking an abortion at any point in the pregnancy. So our next speaker is Viva Ruiz. <laughs> So she's an artist, performer, and she does the work, thank God, for abortion. So please give a warm welcome for Viva Ruiz! Good morning to you lovers of abortion access, and good morning to you only. Abortion not a sin, a blessing. Abortion not a sin, a blessing. <laughs> This is a time lapse of a print of my baby niece developing in the incubator over three days. I print images onto paper with ink made of live bacteria cells that have been genetically modified to produce melanin, specifically eumelanin, which is black and brown. It is the key biopigment behind human skin, hair, and eye color that's also prevalent across all living things and plays an important role in protecting cells. Here, her image only becomes legible as the melanin emerges because our eyes rely on contrast to see. I'm Lucy Kim, and we're in the biology labs at Boston University, where my creative capital project, Melanin Images via Genetically Modified E. coli, is currently based. I wanted to work with a physical material that holds the weight of the conversation around race and color-based social hierarchies, which led me to melanin. But I wanted to keep going and interrogate vision itself and how vision is used to justify a lot of things that are not in fact, fact. I'm a painter by training and my practice is split between my studio where I make sculptural paintings and the lab where I'm working on this project. The work looks very different between the two arenas, but they ask the same questions. How exactly do we see what we see? 
What are the biological and evolutionary frameworks? And what are the cultural and personal constructions? And how exactly do they all intersect? Distortion is an important element of this project because the bacteria is alive and sensitive to microscopic conditions on the paper and shifts how much melanin each cell makes as it evolves, the prints are highly variable. The original images are often distorted by this living process. This project will culminate in small and large prints, sculptural objects, and an edition of artist books. I'm looking for partners to join me in this important conversation institutional partners for exhibitions and programming, and a press and designers to help develop the book and online materials. Thank you. My name is Stephen Kazuo Takasugi. I am a composer. My creative capital project is entitled R.S. in Cody, Heart Mountain. It is written for the Jack String Quartet. Heart Mountain, in Wyoming, was one of ten American concentration camps during the Second World War. This work explores a complex notion of fluid identity that revealed itself to me in my studies of history, my family stories, and my own personal experiences. One particularly striking case was that of Fred Korematsu, who, in order to escape internment, had eyelid surgery performed to disguise himself from the authorities. It's kind of like when I was in my mind's eye, I was up there at his neck looking at the rope.
I'm Crystal Z. Campbell, a multidisciplinary artist, experimental filmmaker, and writer of Black, Filipinx, and Chinese descents based in Oklahoma and New York. My work is rooted in public secrets or information known to many but undertold or underacknowledged. My creative capital project is Postmasters, a multidisciplinary project exploring the intersections of the United States Postal Service and U.S. military alongside parallels between Black history in the United States and U.S. imperialism in the Philippines. The project is loosely inspired by the framing of my familial history as a living archive and careful entanglement of empire and will manifest in several forms experimental film, live performance, installation, paintings over archival materials, objects, and a book. Central to the work is the question, what does it mean to become American? We'll need additional funding, an archival film researcher, a film producer for experimental film, grants and fellowships for time and space, performance support, a film agent, film programmers, institutional partners, and for the book, an editor, an agent, designer, publisher, I'm deeply humbled to be part of the Creative Capital cohort, and I cannot wait to share this project with you all. With gratitude for your time and attention, thank you. My name is Nugent Smith, and I'm an interdisciplinary artist living and working in Jersey City, New Jersey. My project for Creative Capital is titled See Me, See We. This project is essentially a series of contemporary American sculptural portraits of my African ancestors represented through brass busts of my image. These sculptural busts will be informed by my research on facial scarifications, hairstyles, and body adornment of my African ancestors traced back more than 500 years through DNA tests. I will use modern technology such as 3D printing, DNA testing, and the ancient African technology of brass casting to create these works. The idea for this project came about when I read an article about the slowly dying practice of facial scarifications and body scarifications throughout the continent of Africa as a cultural practice. And I wanted to think about ways to continue this practice uh, within a contemporary context. The whole idea is for my African ancestors to recognize me uh, within this, this lifetime, within this realm. And one way I was thinking about that is through finding through research, the scarification practices that my ancestors practiced and including those scarifications on the busts in combination with patterns from my current day lived environment. I intend for the final work essentially to be a conversation through time and space with my African ancestors and to think about what it means to create multi-layered American portraiture in this day and time. You may remember me from boarding up the Whitney Museum. You may remember me from blocking out all of my images on social media. You may remember me from changing my name to American Artist. I'm trying to rebrand as a sculptor, but everyone knows me as a digital artist. And that's not to say I'm not still a digital artist. And my ideas come out of a space of thinking digitally but sculpture has my heart. That's just facts. Um, I love warping time space. I love folding it in on itself. Some ways that I've done that have been through film where it takes place in the past, but it looks like it should be in the future. Or this video that I just made for Shaper of God, where it looks like it was made in the 1960s or 70s, 
but the things they're talking about hadn't happened yet. It is the site of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, a publicly funded space research institute. Let me tell you about Shaper of God. Octavia Butler's mother is from Louisiana. She moved to California in the 1930s, and Octavia Butler was born in 1947. And this was a time in Pasadena history when rocket science was sort of just getting started. It was about a decade old at that point. What I'm doing right now is I'm working on an exhibition that's going to open in Los Angeles. If you see that show, you will see some reference points to the Parable of the Sower novel. So visual things that I pulled from that book alongside fragments that allude to Octavia Butler's lived experience. Let's see if I can find the scripture. Shape God. Hi, my name is Monica de la Torre. My project is called Parallel Interiors, and it focuses on a utopian neighborhood in Mexico City that was designed in 1947. I'll read you an excerpt. Florian, hello again. Here's another postcard for you. So Barragan and El Pedregal's developers conceived of the neighborhood as a refuge from the pressures of modern life in the city. Barragan wanted the neighborhood to feel like a park in which ugly things such as water towers, clotheslines, and power lines would be hidden from view. Streets would be named not after historical events, important battles, the nation's founding fathers, or so-called illustrious politicians, but after natural elements. You could compose a concrete poem by simply listing the names of streets. Cliff, waterfall, mountain, boulevard of light. We lived on fuego, fire. Garcia Marquez lived down the street. Once I slipped a poem under his door. It was in all caps and the opening lines were, I think I'm allergic to this place. It fills me with an overwhelming feeling of estrangement. One night after reading 100 Years of Solitude, I dreamt I was floating above my bed. Although I was tied to it by a leash, the feeling was one of soaring, not of being confined. I could conjure the accelerating sensation of flying at will when most needed. Then I had another dream. I had given birth to a baby with a pig's tail. I was horrified to discover that by the book's logic, I had broken the incest taboo. I was compelled to tell Garcia Marquez about it, so I walked over to his house. He pissed me off that he didn't seem to want to know about the effects of his writing on his readers. The maid wouldn't let me in. But he's a magical realist, I said. I kept an eye on his house all afternoon, hoping to catch him as he was leaving. I did the same the following day and the following. I started taking the dog out for more walks than he needed. Except for the driver who would return my eager glances with a friendly nod, I never saw anyone there. Only a healthy bougainvillea near the doorway. A tall white wall hid everything else from view. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Alexandra Schreiter, and I'm a professor of comparative literature and film at Tufts University and a novelist primarily working in Arabic. Um, I'm sitting in the stairwell because actually the stairwell is one of the main uh, settings of my creative capital project that's titled Sweet Meats. Uh, Sweet Meats is a podcast in English and a novel in Arabic uh, that is set in a fictional border town uh, between Lebanon and Syria on the Lebanese side of the border. Uh, this area is associated often with uh, poverty, with being a desolate area. Uh, there's a, in certain places, there's a robust drug trade. Uh, in other places, there's a robust smuggling trade. So in the midst of all of this, a Syrian family resides in this Lebanese town uh, for a very long time. And when the Syrian protests start to kind of morph into armed warfare, their status begins to deteriorate in Lebanon until they become undocumented. Uh, one of the members of this family is a retired wedding singer. Her name is Nafise. And uh, one evening, she goes to visit her sister, goes down the stairs to her sister's basement, um, and, um, uh, and discovers a body hidden in a fridge inside of the basement. She has no clue who left it there, but on a whim, she decides to take care of the body, to get rid of it uh, on her own. 
Um, as she does that, she tries to, to remove all evidence implicating her sister um, and tries to understand who put the body there in the first place. And as Nafisa peels away all these layers, uh, she her fate is intertwined with that of a trans reporter who is in the town at that time to expose this hidden history of the town, a queer history of the town that's been erased. Um, and also with uh, a migrant worker who now runs a vigilante group of women. Um, so the reason why I'm working between media uh, is to bring um, Arabic culture to an English speaking audience in a way that's outside of the university classroom, outside of spaces of privilege and specialization. The thing I'm interested in the most is uh, exploring the intersectional links between migration, xenophobia, feminized labor, migrant labor, um, queerness and war. Thanks for listening. This is Suzanne Césaire. She and her husband, Amé Césaire, were at the center of a movement called Negritude. Inspired by the Harlem Renaissance, a group of students from Africa and the Antilles coined the term Negritude in 1930s Paris as a cry of black power. They published newspapers as a means to spread their message, in which they debated and fermented righteous rage. And when they went home to their home countries, what started as an idea became a revolution. May Césaire would become the leader of Martinique and the most important black statesman in France. But that comes later. First, Amé and Suzanne met this guy, a man named André Breton. Yeah, this guy. André Breton was the founder of the Surrealist movement, a movement in art that was both aesthetic and political and full of contradictions. Anyways, he showed up to Martinique during World War II on his way to New York and sought out Amé and Suzanne, and they took a trip to the forest outside the island's capital, Fort de France. Their trip in the forest changed all of their lives. They leave the forest transformed, and then things really start happening. Andre and Suzanne begin a multi-decade Amoris correspondence. Andre goes to New York, but publishes Amé and Suzanne's writing in English and then in Spanish. Their writing travels all over the Caribbean, inspiring more revolution. Suzanne's writing on revolution and commitment to organizing is at the heart of this effort. Our film moves between the historic record and the images we might have had if history had been recorded differently. As Suzanne wrote in a letter to a confidant, I'm not dreaming of a new myth. I want it to come, and I'm looking for it. I carry with me the idea of its necessary birth, and I'm waiting. What, what I believe I was put on this earth for is to succeed so that I could compensate for my father what he put what he went through. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's been a tough burden to carry. Because you know you can you just can't forget those things. I mean, people say forget it. It was a long time ago. No, I can't forget it. Never, never will forget it. Right. So it doesn't take like some crazy, um, you know, rescuing to pull out most legacies. You know, the stuff is there. It's just about caring for it. Um, he said it's elbow grease, right? That's what it was. It, it's, not, it's not beat up. It's not been repaired. Yeah, it's not, it's been, not been overused. Repaired. It's been underused. It's yeah. barely been played. 
and it hadn't been buffed, so. I mean, it's had the keys off it probably since the 50s. Right. So. The part that I knew of him most was the music. And so that was natural for me to, to want to be uh, near that part of him. And so I started playing saxophone and the rest, rest is history, really. Hi, I'm Marcos Varela. I'm a musician, composer, producer, band leader, and educator. For almost 20 years, I've been based in New York City and active in the local jazz scene here. I also tour nationally and internationally, leading my own bands and playing with a number of great jazz and contemporary artists. My creative capital project, tentatively titled Ice Storm, explores the themes of migration, cultural exchange, collaboration, and individual as well as collective identity. Through an album and a series of multimedia site-specific performances, I will explore how the earth-shattering events of 2020 to 2021 intersect with the history and culture of jazz, U.S. history, and my own identity as a musician from Texas of Mexican heritage. My goals for my creative capital project are to build awareness of ongoing systemic issues in the U.S., but also to promote bridge building through creative collaboration during an extremely polarized and isolating time. I also hope that the project is healing and affirming for Black and Hispanic people. Our histories are often told through a lens of trauma and marginalization, but I want to use this opportunity to showcase our resilience and creativity and our immense contributions to the American story and cultural canon. Hola. Mi nombre es Madeline Jiménez y junto con Ramón Miranda estamos construyendo el proyecto que se llama Canibalia. Canibalia consiste en un conjunto de obras que incluyen esculturas, pinturas y fotografías que guardan una relación intrínseca con la geografía que habitan. La producción y documentación se realizará tanto en Puerto Rico como en México. Las fotografías serán parte de un libro que explorará ideas en torno a un tipo de formalismo, desarrollado deliberadamente tanto fuera como en la periferia de la modernidad. Nuestras obras contaminan nuestra voluntad con la voluntad del objeto. Este proyecto aporta una conciencia que considera a otros que no podemos comprender. Nuestro proceso creativo es una colaboración entre el material que estamos trabajando el ambiente natural donde vivimos y nuestra subjetividad. Otras personas que nos acompañan en este proceso de pensar el arte del Caribe escribirán ensayos para el libro. Canibalia canibalizará el formalismo moderno occidental para producir nuevas formas en el arte. Nuestro objetivo es desarrollar nuestro trabajo pensándolo junto con nuestra región. Distribuiremos nuestro libro a otras personas e instituciones en el Caribe que son parte de esta discusión, con el fin de difundir nuestras ideas. Muchas gracias por escucharnos. In 1998, the summer before I started high school, my family lost our home in East Palo Alto, California. Of course, there's the trauma of unstable housing, but there's also this very specific trauma around losing family photographs, images that you may never see again, but only have a faint memory of. Around 2010, I began collecting black vernacular photographs from flea markets, antique stores, and eventually eBay. Certainly I was trying to cope, right? I was looking for images that reminded me of images that I had lost. I was looking for uh, images that reminded me of moments of joy, even if I didn't remember the photograph itself. 
And in this process of searching for these photographs, I was exposed to an entire ecosystem, an entire world of black vernacular photographs that were being circulated as commodity. They were being circulated um, outside um, the communities from which they came, outside the families from which they came. And I became very disturbed and curious about what it meant for these private moments to be sold by dealers, what it meant for buyers, what were they were intending to do with them. And so now with over 4,000 photographs in my collection, Black Orbits is sort of an attempt to sort of take these images out of circulation to both identify and create more ethical conditions under which to share these photographs. Black Orbits is an archival project, a digital archival project that lives at the intersection of Black privacy and interiority, the archival impulse to collect and share, and these contemporary controversies over the ownership of Black vernacular photographs. I'm working in collaboration with creative technologists, designers, and interface designers to basically figure out how do we build in a web-based culture that makes space for care, intentionality, and rituals of patience and slow reading. So instead of just an archive of photographs of Black folks doing things, I'm interested in sort of the conceptual framework of care, the conceptual framework of digital cultures, and the conceptual frameworks of ethics in the process of looking. How do we look with care? How do we look with a strong ethos and values that takes care of and is attuned to the privacy, the needs, the interiority of the folks depicted? And how do we think through questions around permission for sharing? How do we think through questions um, of repatriation of these images? How do we think through questions of permanence? And so this Creative Capital Grant provides a great opportunity for me to think through these issues in a long-term fashion and to really collaborate with a range of individuals and organizations to make this project, which has mostly lived in my head for the past 12 years, into a reality. Hi, my name's Mora. I'm a video artist and a private investigator based in Los Angeles, and my project is called Private Client Services. Private Client Services is a video performance in which I'm going to attempt to launder money through art acquisition. In order to do this, I'm going to be creating a series of offshore uh, and uh, domestic shell corporations. Um, and each of these corporations will own the other one by serving as its board of directors in a kind of um, Russian dolls type corporate structure. Um, with this corporate architecture, I will then purchase uh, and sell anonymously an artwork. Um, as part of the project, I'm going to be making a travel video in which I travel to each international jurisdiction where I own a corporation um, and talk to people in the art world and the financial services industry about the financialization of art and art as an asset um, for tax avoidance uh, and other forms of financial crime. Um, but what I'm really looking forward to doing at the end of the day is visiting places like the Cayman Islands and the Seychelles and Panama and the British Virgin Islands and drinking uh, cocktails out of coconut shaped drinks. Thanks. The piece I was working on is called Three Rights, uh, Life, Liberty, and Happiness. I became very interested in why the United States Declaration of Independence included life, liberty, and happiness as unalienable rights. And what does that mean? You know, how do governments protect life? How do they protect liberty and happiness? And also specifically for whom? How does that all translate into the movement? How does that, those concepts live in the body? And so that's what I'm trying to tackle in this piece and specifically coming from looking at it from the lens of the black experience in America. We're in the midst of making these roots, uh, 1,865 roots, which are um, hanging from the ceiling to the floor. Some of them are eight feet long, some of them are like 25 or 30 feet long. And so the audience has to move through these roots in order before they meet the liberty character. One of the things that I feel like I learned from this um, 
is realizing that we don't often talk about race in uh, mixed groups. And by mixed groups, I mean people of different ethnicities being in the same group. But how can this piece be used as a way, as a catalyst for bringing people together to talk about things that are difficult? And so one of my takeaways is going, oh, okay, we need to have um, a way to have discussions about this after each performance. Because initially I thought it would only maybe be something that would happen occasionally, but going, oh, this could happen more often. My name is Annie Han. My name is Edgar Arsenault. I would like to take a few moments to say why creative capital is so special and unique. At Creative Capital, we don't just provide the funds, but we are in search of unique projects that recognize the risks artists are taking. You know, Creative Capital has always been a special organization for me. You know, just starting off as a young artist, um, I was welcomed into the Creative Capital family and realized that the level of engagement and support goes far beyond the money, goes far beyond the grant, and that they actually walk alongside you throughout the process. This takes years of staying in contact and giving hands-on support. I believe it's one of the most important things we can be doing to understand, share, and connect with one another at this moment. So everyone who's listening, the Creative Capital family is always expanding. We love having more members. We have a lot more love to give. So please support Creative Capital, support Creative Capital artists so we can continue doing this great work.
Magic and dreaming all the time Tragic mistakes we can't rewind I'm Clement Goldberg a multidisciplinary artist and filmmaker. My satirical yet hopeful work centers grief rooted in climate crisis, cultural erasure, and extinction. I had a morale obligation to do something. I often combine live action and stop motion animation when creating narrative projects. And I will continue that practice with Let Me Let You Go. Let Me Let You Go is groundbreaking art house cinema for the psychedelic masses. Isolated weirdos. Tense imaginative spaces, a world on the brink of collapse. In this near future science fiction comedy feature film, a biotech billionaire offers two transmasculine artists a chance to survive imminent societal and ecological collapse if they get inoculated with the fungal serum. So what's in this? It's from the light green box. It's kind of, Mm, astral and expansive. Dramatic side effects arise. They must grapple with their new surroundings and overcome their codependent nature or risk dissolving into a collective mushroom. Not letting go of the past, I see. No one likes a bitter mushroom. As the film opens, Miguel is sick of his gig as a psychedelic trip sitter. Miguel, shouldn't you be documenting my insights? Oh, um, you're basic, but... If you want to upgrade to the innovator package, I can... Nah, I brain train. Nootropics five days a week. Outstanding memory. But uh, don't worry, I'll give you a good rating. We want to bring the plant world into the public eye and public heart. Plant sensing, plant hormones, plant communication and intelligence, the inner world of plants remain a scientific mystery. However, plants are the most common genetically modified organisms. Transgenic crops are all around us. We don't seem to have a problem with plants as GMO. The molecular basis of plant life is fascinating. It's an interesting coincidence that the rules of heredity were discovered via close study of pea plants by Gregor Mendel in 1800s. Altering plant biology in the service of humans is an old concept. What's new is designing a plant ecosystem for the sole purpose of stopping climate change. Whatever solutions we ought to have for climate crisis, we ought to have them now. The next 28 years are very critical for us. By 2050, without new policies, global greenhouse gas emissions are projected to increase by 50% primarily due to a 70% growth in energy-related carbon dioxide emissions. Is photosynthesis efficient enough? Green is the color of photosynthesis as blue and red light is kept, and green is reflected by chlorophyll. However, green is a high energy bandwidth, and if it was absorbed, photosynthetic efficiency could increase fivefold. When plants absorb the entirety of the visible spectrum, they will look black. Black forests, black lakes, black meadows, black farms with black crops, black gardens with black flowers. Welcome to Dark Botany. Hi, I'm Xavier Cortada, the proud son of two Cuban refugees and an artist living and working in Miami. As a socially engaged artist, I use the power, the elasticity of art as a way of working across disciplines in order to engage my community in problem solving. Thanks to Creative Capital and the project that they have funded, The Underwater, I am trying to engage my community and letting them understand their vulnerability to rising seas and to global climate change. I also wanna give them some tools to help them bring about more equitable responses to this future. Back in 2006, I remember being in Antarctica 
and a scientist, a glaciologist, gave me a chunk of glacier, and he said, this is the very ice that threatens to drown your city. I took that ice and I created Antarctic ice paintings. Paintings made in Antarctica with Antarctica, with the information about Antarctica. That ice painting is central to this project because it's going to be the backdrop of yard signs that my community members are gonna create and put in their front lawns. But importantly, it's gonna have a number on it. And that number is gonna be hand drawn by the resident of that house who using an app is going to figure out how many feet above sea level their house sits. And by putting that yard sign, by having the courage, the audacity to put that yard sign in their front yard, they're signaling to their neighbors and everyone else that they stand in a vulnerable position and hopefully can begin to engage in conversations where communities can learn and work together to begin to problem solve. So the underwater can be a model for artists to use across every place where land touches water in order to engage community and bring about equitable responses to the catastrophe that is before us. Hello, my name is Jermaine Barnes. I am a designer and a professor at the University of Miami School of Architecture. Uh, I run a practice called Studio Barnes, where we are very interested in things related to blackness and black domesticity in the built environment. I've been fortunate enough to be awarded a creative capital grant for my project, Restructuring Blackness, uh, which is essentially me looking at the contributions of the diaspora to classical architecture. I'm currently based in Rome, where I'm doing the first leg of research and producing some drawings and analyzations which go towards that work. Uh, two important things that I've learned throughout this process is that there are some pretty interesting processes that are not attributed or correctly attributed or widely contributed or even widely acknowledged as distinctly African processes related to classical architecture. One of those is opus sectile, which is something that is used uh, with land mosaic floors within uh, Roman architecture. And it's something that's very rarely acknowledged as an Egyptian process, something that was taken from the continent. Um, you see over my shoulder here in my studio, I've begun experimenting with different types of materials and processes to sort of mimic the same thing. Uh, the second that I've learned is a uh, opus Africanum. And with that is sort of this process of taking horizontal elements and then placing vertical elements on top of those within a wall that creates something structural with small bricks being placed in between. So with these new things that I'm beginning to understand and uncover through my time here in Italy, it is uh, going to help me to create a brand new column order, a sixth column order, uh, if you will, which then allows me to create new possibilities of blackness and neoclassical architecture. So imagine in the States, uh, places like the Capitol building, which have tons of the traditional three orders um, adorned on their front facade. What if those were column orders that were then created and inspired by uh, the black people that were enslaved and brought to this country? Um, and for those of you who may not know what the orders are, traditionally we acknowledge Corinthian, Doric, and Ionic orders, but there's two more. There's the Tuscan order and the composite order, which were created in Italy. So there's a precedent uh, for this process, but there really isn't much of a precedent for a holy black order or a holy diasporic order, um, separate from the Egyptian orders, which literally created all of the orders. And as someone that was trained as an architect, this is just narratives that I've never been uh, sort of exposed to. And so I'm really hoping that with this project that again, thank you Creative Capital for uh, funding, allows other people who go through architecture who look like me to understand that there's so much of a wider impact um, than what we were initially taught. And so I'm very excited about where this will yield and the kind of stuff that will happen from this project. And thank you for hanging out with me. Bye.
amatake bi a petekile me chante ta wogla ke hane pe cheese up Hello everybody, my name is Steve Tamayo. I'm a member of the Rosewood Sioux Tribe. In my language, we identify ourselves as the Sichangu, the Burnt Thai people. Lakota is the dialect in which I speak. In 2016, there was a school that was created on the Standing Rock Reservation at a protest camp. It was called the Mini Wichoni Nakichizi Owaiwa. And so this school was actually named by the children, by the students at that camp. And so in my language, this translates into the Defenders of the Water School. And so I was the traditional arts teacher for the school. One day they brought in a buffalo. And so I took my students over to show them the process of butchering the buffalo and skinning out that buffalo. Then I explained the process of tanning that buffalo hide. And so that leads to my project. And so my project is to paint, adorn, quill, and bead all of the buffalo robes of the Lakota people. And so through the symbology, we are storytellers. Through our orator skills, we explain the history of the people, the stages of life, the exploits and deeds carried out amongst all of our Lakota relatives. What becomes possible when we move from a place of deep listening, when we attune to feet, crown, earth, spirit. My name is Marina Magalhães and I am a choreographer from Brazil living on unceded Tongva land, AKA Los Angeles. Body as a Crossroads is a performance project that mobilizes dance as a change-making practice. Our bodies carry deep wisdom about how to be with the world, and our dancing can act as a harvesting tool, allowing us to retrieve and cultivate this wisdom in ways that reverberate spiritually and politically. We are living in dangerously uncertain times and our very survival on this earth depends on our ability to be with this uncertainty and from it cultivate radical ways of being. Our bodies are our ultimate teachers in this work, reminding us time and again that it's possible to breathe when exhausted to find sabor in the offbeat, to fall off balance and land softly. Diverse Works recently commissioned the first activation of our project in April, 2022. And we look forward to finding more partners to continue carrying out this work. As we say back home, a dança continua. Hi, I'm Ilana Coman. I'm the director and the co-writer of the project The Inventory. I'm Jamie Gonsalves, the producer of The Inventory, a film that exists in the liminal space of documentary and fiction. This film uses testimonies of mothers looking for their children in Mexican territory and bureaucratic situations that simulate what the mothers have faced, the obstacles that have faced. Uh, it explores the complexities of language and strives to indict and question how we think and approach language. Right now, the structure is more like a poem where like each scene unfolds separate from each other. And once you experience the film is when you get to question like the language and what is happening in Mexico with the disappearances and how we talk about violence as well.
When I was incarcerated in Maryland more than 20 years ago, after participating in a national narrative that featured crack cocaine as both seller and user, I was convicted of a series of felonies that would send me to Roxbury Correction in Hagerstown, Maryland. I began writing in a small circle of fellow detainees that would change the trajectory of my life. I am now an award-winning author and University of New Haven English professor in the Colleges of Arts and Sciences. As a matter of fact, I am the only tenured professor that I know of with seven felony convictions in the United States. Now today I'm speaking to you from the Youth Detention Center in Birmingham, Alabama. And I'm very excited to talk about our project, Radical Reversal, which explores how art can play a pivotal role in social justice while providing pathways for artists to give back. A collaboration between myself, Randall Horton, and composer Devin Braja Wallman, we as artists seek to improve the quality of life for those within the criminal justice system. Focusing on Minnesota Correctional Facility in Faribault and Suffolk County Detention Center in Boston, the work will provide a way for women and men to reclaim their humanity through the creative process. Radical Reversal will set up a home recording studio and creative performance space at the two facilities, where participants will be able to create poetry and music, play and learn the process of digital editing. We hope to create a new dialogue that puts art at the forefront of restorative justice and prepares the returning citizen for life long after the physical release from the inside. Our project culminates with cultivated collaboration within both facilities, performing live streams of their work. The equipment will live as permanent fixtures, allowing the space to be utilized long after the physical performance. You see, we are working right now to set up the space. As you can see, we're getting it together. We got a production desk, we got instruments, we got drums, teaching artists is coming, a band, and then we're gonna, they're gonna be performance opportunities now. If you would love to radically reverse the narrative of incarceration, then we invite you to learn more about us and support this life-changing project. Hi, my name is Jalarina and I'm making a show about everything. My everything, which is in kind everybody's everything. To be only slightly more specific, I'm creating a series of plays in hip hop theater about a hero whose superpower is fueled by his abuse of heroin. The hero is my father and the heroine is <laughs> This project is shaped to expound upon the glory of the terrible, to expand in dramatic direction on the potency and frequency of morbid gain. Primary, secondary, and tertiary morbid gain are psychological concepts used to describe the conscious and unconscious benefits of an illness. These sometimes motivate a person to maintain certain negative behaviors or patterns that might keep them ill. I was 12 when I became convinced that there wasn't anything on earth that felt better than being high. And it wasn't the physical biological response. When my father used, he felt beautiful, free. And my siblings and I held an impenetrable confidence in how much he loved us because of how hard he fought to get back to us despite this, every single time. Personally, I get to create an elaborate show about my first and greatest friend. More importantly, I aim to cultivate a space in which we return to our people by walking away from the toxins we believe affirm and protect us. This is everything. This is as good as mine. Yeah, hey, y'all need to get all this right. <laughs> y'all need to get all this right. It's dope too, cause the, the fit. You ain't lying. You ain't lying. I'm trying to hold you up cause you fit fall. Oh yeah? Yeah, it's kind of, I mean, it's not heavy, Caleb, but you just gotta, don't lean all the way to one leg to another. Kind of keep it balanced in the middle. All
My name is Sunil Sansgeri. I'm an artist, researcher, and filmmaker. And for the past three years, I've been working on a trilogy of short films contending with questions around ancestral memory, diaspora, history, decolonization, and cross-continental solidarity. These films think through a series of questions and reflections of how we live through moments of violence and revolt, particularly through the lens of my family's biography and my own identity. I began this process in mid-2019 sparked by a curiosity and a sense of homesickness about how screen-based technologies, cinema, and images of the past change our relationship to questions of diaspora and belonging. My first feature-length film is no exception. Two Refusals is a personal journey through ancestry, anti-colonialism, and harbingers of descent across India and Africa, repositioning myths from Portugal's oldest work of epic poetry, the Lusiads, as a counter-reading against empire. This experimental essay film looks to sites of colonial rejection and resistance across these two continents, as I chart the major and the minor, the mythic and the historic, weaving together personal reflections on my family's history as freedom fighters against the occupying Portuguese forces in Goa, with stories of liberation and resistance across the Goan diaspora in Africa. This film focuses on the stories of mutual struggle that developed across the two continents against the Portuguese and British empires. Shot on location in India, Portugal, and Africa in the lush quality of 16mm, this film traces the relics of resistance my ancestors used, such as the sabers used to fight against the Portuguese hundreds of years ago that still hang above the mantle in my grandmother's ancestral home. Thank you, and stay tuned for more information soon. My entire career as a band leader and composer has been dedicated to exploring the common ground between jazz and Afro-diasporic music from the Caribbean, North Africa, and South America. I would like to travel to these places and record a new piece and document the whole journey. My proposed project will further explore and synthesize this relationship and involves two main parts. First, I will undertake specific collaborations with master musicians from 10 countries. Brazil, Colombia, Haiti, Cuba, Trinidad, Guadeloupe, Martinique, Morocco, Mali, and Cap Verde, each of whom represents a particular tradition. For example, in my native Guadeloupe, I will work with a master of the Guoca tradition, recording a traditional piece of Guoca music in dialogue with my saxophone. I will repeat this process in each country. Next, I will create jazz arrangements of the same pieces which I will record with my US based ensemble and ultimately release alongside the original collaborations. The final result will have rich ethnomusicological and intercultural implications as members of the Afro diaspora celebrate and explore our shared history. Throughout this journey, filmmaker Gita Gambier will be at my side with a skeleton crew, recording all interactions and moments of magic along the way, as well as personal reflections Eventually, this will be a colorful saga in search of the scattered musical seeds that blossomed throughout the African diaspora. Buenas y bienvenidos a Bal Trips Airlines, tu agencia primordial para un viaje cultural. I'm Paola Segura Cornelio, artist, designer, and CEO of Baltrips Agency. I thought about this project. It came to me the last time I was in the Dominican Republic, BC, before Corona. 
And me and my family were traveling to an area in the south of the island that shall remain nameless to protect it, at least until more people interact with Valtrip's content. Um, this place is essentially El Cielo en la Tierra. And I remember that beyond being excited to be there, I was anxious to interact with other tourists in that space. Me incomodó la idea de ver otros turistas ahí porque their specific social, economic, and cultural dynamics, most importantly between first world countries and my own, that are present in a lot more than U.S. foreign trade policies or our history of colonization. They're present in all industries y como los que viajan tratan a los que viven donde tu vacaciona. So I got inspired initially just to make a video that was similar to the videos you see when you get on a plane. You know, they tell you the safety protocols, they tell you what to do with your phones and the exit routes. Pero yo quería hacer un video que te diga cómo no ser un representante de eh, colonialismo, del imperialismo y de primer mundismo. Um, from there, the project has grown. I think that initially it was just about the video, but now I kind of want to flesh out the whole Valtrips agency. I want to um, make a website that has Priceline vibes and kind of gives you tips and tricks to travel. I want to have an installation space that can potentially travel too, so people can interact with this at airports or near airports where they are when they are getting ready to go on a trip. I also plan to make uniforms for the agency employees with tropical prints that are collages of the flora and fauna of tourism. But more importantly, and I think informing all of that, I want to travel to the Dominican Republic and be able to talk to people that work in the tourism industry now. Um, I hope to be able to archive all of these stories so they have an opportunity to tell us firsthand how to vacation in their homes. Um, and hopefully then my video just becomes a summary of their points. Bienvenidos a Valtri. Hi, my name is Graham Haynes. I'm very happy to have received the grant by Creative Capital. And my project is a requiem. It's called Requiem for Black Male Victims of Police Violence in America. It's dealing with black male victims that have been murdered by police in America for the last 200 some odd years. <laughs> I'm the composer. There is a text in Latin and in English. The English part of the text was written by Carrie Mae Weems, and it is for full orchestra with two male choruses. I'm composing the piece. I'm working every day here. Uh, I hope to have it finished within the next month or so, and I hope to have it performed in 2023 at some point before the end of the year. I'm Deborah Goff, a New England-based dance artist, educator, curator, and director of Scapegoat Garden. I've been working through questions of visibility for some time. I've wondered how we might orient ourselves to better perceive and care for one another. In my Creative Capital project, Liturgy Order Bridge, I'm turning to dance practice as a faith practice, through which embodied rituals of care, hospitality, and togetherness are revered and networks of connection are made visible. So together with Lauren Horn, Arian Wilkerson, and Abana Kumson Davis, I'm unsuturing and reweaving the project's tangle of influences. One, Resma Menachem's observation that Black folks have always employed embodied techniques like rocking, clapping, singing, and call and response as antidotes to the effects of racism on our nervous systems. Two, Ashan Crawley's treaties on Black Pentecostalism as a path to otherwise possibilities. Three, my vision of a clergy of facilitators who support audiences, shared though distinct responsibilities for the dynamism and consequence of the performance moment. Four, Kirby Jean Raymond's invocation of the Black church in his Pyre Moss fashion shows, 
and the absurdity of Fellini's ecclesiastical fashion show in the 1972 film Roma. And five, gardens. Always gardens. In our garden, flowers grow to human scale. Liturgical vestments adorn more than one body at the same time. We just might bloom ourselves as we sing together, clap together, find virtuosity in a chorus of step touches and bear witness. This is just a beginning. My name is Sarah Rosalina, and I am an interdisciplinary artist and researcher based in Los Angeles. I practice craft through my matriarchal bloodline of the Wiyarika. I am assistant professor of computational craft and haptic media at UC Santa Barbara. My work deconstructs technology with material interventions that collapse binaries and borders between earth and space. My project standard candle rethinks astronomical observatory instrumentation through feminist and anti-colonial perspectives by using digital weaving and indigenous beading to reinterpret telescopic images in textile form. Cosmology is deeply entwined in imperial aspects of science and technology through observation. Mount Wilson Observatory in Southern California is ground zero for measuring our universe and proving that our universe is expanding off of stolen Tongva land, providing a conceptual vantage point where men of science produce precise instruments for observation, claiming political power over knowledge. Women were hired and labeled as computers, which made their research possible by cataloging, classifying stars. Standard Candle uses pixels and resolution as a starting point to re-examine observation measurement and knowledge of space. Standard Candle weaves data collected by these unrecognized computer laborers as woven form through space and time, imaging historical observations of celestial places that are now obscured by light pollution.
Hi everybody, my name is Sam and I'm here to introduce T Moana Meridian, an experimental opera based on a proposal to the United Nations to relocate the International Prime Meridian from Greenwich, London to the South Pacific Ocean. Why? Because fuck Western imperialism, time and space are instruments of nature, not white supremacy. The project currently exists as a five channel video installation featuring an incredible cast of performers that, thanks to creative capital, will now be realized in its originally intended form as a large site responsive performance work. <laughs> Oh,